minutes away from your nice, safe neighborhood, there's a war going on. And the news isn't covering it. Either they don't know, don't show, or don't care about what's going on in the hood. Boys in the Hood. It's the kind of news that usually gets buried. Rated R. Hey there, welcome back to another video. This time around, it is my review of the 1991 drama, Boys in the Hood. Now, before I get around to sharing more of my thoughts on this film, I want to give a special shout out to John for requesting this review. If there's another film, TV show, or topic that you would like to see me discuss in the future, feel free to donate to my PayPal. The link will be in the video description down below. Now, Boys in the Hood is one of those films that has left a definite mark on society and culture, not just cinema. Uh, this is a film that has actually spread a message to a lot of people and helped them go on the right path in life. And that's something that I just find so amazing. And I'm not the only one. John Singleton, the writer and director, and a lot of other people involved with the film are very proud of the fact that this is a film that did exactly what they wanted it to. They wanted this film to be a cautionary tale, to showcase the raw and bitter reality of gang life and how it isn't as glamorous as some of these gangster uh, films might make it appear to be, or these rap songs or so on. He wanted to showcase that this is something that can really devastate your life. And he wanted to show people that there was a way out of it, which is something that you didn't see that much of uh, at the time. But at the same time, he didn't want to tell a fairy tale where there's like a fairy tale ending and everybody lives happily ever after. That's why the tagline is this ain't no fairy tale, because it's not. There's still a lot of genuine reality here, but mixed in with all of that, mixed in with the depression and the death, there is hope. And I think that is what made the film reach so many people is that you have these moments where it, it does seem like there's a light at the end of the tunnel. The film is directed by John Singleton, and he did just an absolutely spectacular job directing this film. Uh, it, it really does maintain the right tone throughout. It's very consistent in terms of the way the shots are set up. And uh, it's, to me, a really impressive film because there's a lot of spirit to it in terms of the energy uh and it doesn't really feel like a film that's trying too hard to be too over ambitious when it comes to its scope uh he still grounds it very firmly in reality and his direction is something that really does tie into that there's a lot of shots in this that almost have this documentary kind of feel to them but then there's other shots that uh are a little bit more unique. Uh, they're not just trying to be street level kind of things. So it's a nice mix of different techniques. And then on top of that, he 100% had an enormous amount of passion for this film and this project. And you can tell, you can tell that this is something that he felt like was very important. He felt it was an important film. And he felt that it was something that was really a big moment in his life and his career to effectively showcase all the commentary and all the characterization and, and the overall story that he was trying to tell. And he fought for his spot on the director's chair. And it paid off because the studio was actually considering hiring someone else. And he was putting his foot down and he was adamant. He was like, no, 
I'm not going to allow some white guy from fucking Idaho or California, you know, some other part of California direct a movie about living in the hood and the realities of the of being in the hood. I'm not going to do that. And I, I just think that was such a great thing for uh, John Singleton to do at the time, because this film's success is tied very firmly into him being in the director's chair, being the one to tell the story visually and cinematically, and not just the guy who uh, wrote the movie, because there's a lot of instances where, where you will have people who have a very definite, clear vision of something when it comes to the screenplay, and then someone else directs it, and it just comes across as very cloudy, and uh, the messages aren't conveyed as strongly, and I think that easily could have been the case if he had some white guy directing this movie. I mean, no offense, I'm white, but I don't think that this that would really be the best choice for this kind of film. Uh, this is one of those rare instances where I feel someone with a certain amount of experience, like real life experience with the environment that and the setting of the story is something that is very uh, paramount and very integral to the overall success of the film. So yeah, John Singleton did a great job directing it, but he also did a phenomenal job writing this film. This is not as raw and in your face as other films of the genre, like Menace to Society, for instance, but it still has its moments of raw, gritty reality. And I think it's one of those films that is still really effective as a drama, despite the fact that it's a little bit more soap opera to be perfectly honest, because of the emotional angles, the emotional focus. But I don't think that's really a bad thing. There are different approaches to storytelling. And Singleton wanted to showcase a more, a more soulful, a more emotional story. And... I think that's also a way that he was able to connect with more audiences of multiple races because of the fact that the script has this emotional core and the characters are just so well fleshed out and written. Uh, you start to really relate to and care about these characters as if you are getting to know them personally. So you start to really invest in, in their lives and it also to me is one of the best examples of a film that is definitely trying to say something it's definitely trying to have a message that doesn't beat you over the head with it this is a film that i think a lot of filmmakers today and writers today could take notes from this is how you can make a film that conveys a message about race in America and does it in a way that does not become desensitizing because when you consistently just beat the audience over the head with the message, it starts to lose its impact. And the strongest way to convey a message in film for me and in any story is to Build up the story, build up the characters, do all that first, make that, make those the foundation, and then you can use social commentary about race, about gentrification, about uh, the epidemic of gang violence, specifically African Americans killing other African Americans over an unbelievably petty bullshit. And you can throw all that in there as building blocks, as bricks, not the entire building. So 
that way you have a strong foundation that isn't just built on something that's incredibly flimsy despite how uh, important the message is because if you just keep repeating the same thing over and over again it's just not going to resonate as strongly it doesn't matter what it is so I love the way that social commentary is handled in this I love how a lot of it is relegated to these speeches by Furious and he's talking to these other young uh, African Americans and telling them about the realities of things about gentrification and how African Americans in their neighborhoods should be buying more homes, should have more businesses that are owned by black men and women, uh, so that it, they can actually have a community that is truly their own. And I also like the really raw and unflinching uh, aspects of the script. Showing things that you rarely see, like the mother who is strung out on crack all the time and is not able to keep track of her kids, the racist black cop, because that's something that is a reality. That's a real thing. That's not a Hollywood fabrication. Uh, in America and in other countries, there are a lot of authority figures of a particular race who are discriminatory against the same race that they are a part of. And it's something that it's just so baffling. And John Singleton included it because it was a, based on a real life experience of his. He still could not believe that, you know, a fellow African-American, a fellow black man was being so racist towards him and, and other people that he new and i i really do like the fact that john included that in this film because it's something that still occurs to this day uh for instance in the most recent uh big controversy the 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 crime uh that that featured uh, george floyd i hope i got his name correctly the cops that were there, there was the guy, the motherfucker who put his knee on his neck, but there were also other cops that were of other races. So this idea that white people are the only people that are racist towards black people is, is a bunch of bullshit. And I, I like the fact that Boys in the Hood provides that balance. John provided that balance on, on purpose to show that this is something that does happen. That this is also a problem when it comes to racism in America. It's not just a case of white versus black. Even though that's what it is predominantly, but there still are those moments where you have black versus black. And... On top of that, when it comes to the other things you rarely see, I like the fact that it showed that kids, even at very young ages, like 8 or 10 years old, are very proud of the fact that they are part of a gang, and they join these gangs at very young ages. Uh, and also just showcasing just how brutal and how tragic and how sad uh, this path is. And, and why it's so attractive to a lot of young African Americans, especially in these kind of communities, because it provides them with something that they don't really have. A lot of them don't have uh, uh, families. A lot of them don't have brothers or sisters. A lot of them don't have, in their minds, and according to a lot of the other people around them, a viable way to make a consistent income or to be able to do or achieve what they want in life. So gang life provides a lot of those things that they aren't really able to get or they think they can't get. So that leads them to just becoming absorbed and just infatuated and just absolutely obsessed with this 
with this path in life and for a lot of them it leads to their demise even to people that might have some promise and it also leads to people dying that uh aren't really wanting to choose that path in life and are doing everything they can to go into in a different direction and having ricky be the one that gets shot i i think that was a really inspired storytelling choice because not only is it unexpected the first time around but also it's something that really does showcase that there are all kinds of victims in this vicious cycle uh when it comes to gang violence there are gang members shooting other gang members but there's also people who are completely innocent who are not even remotely involved in any of it who are caught in the crossfire and i like the structure of the story and how things start out with these characters as kids uh i thought that was an interesting and rather unique storytelling device uh in a lot of ways it kind of reminded me of stand by me you know with the an, an african-american stand by me with these kids who are living in the hood and you see all these experiences that they're having at a young age like seeing a dead body and having these moments these run-ins with gangs getting in fights at school and then of course it flashes forward and now you've got uh these characters who are grown up now and and the the kid who was arrested at the end of the the prologue doughboy he's still a career criminal he's still part of these gangs um the kid that you th the kids that you think were gonna maybe put their best foot forward and not get caught up in all the gang uh violence and and the cycle of gang uh life they are on a better path so you've got trey who's going to school and getting good grades and seems like he's going to be able to go to college and you've got uh ricky who seems like he's going to be able to go to college because of the sports uh scholarship because of the talent that he has uh when it comes to playing football something that he was very passionate about when he was a kid but then despite all of that they still are friends with doughboy despite the fact that he's a criminal despite the fact that he's a, a, a member of a gang and there's still a lot of respect you know with those uh three and there's still a genuine connection with them and I like that things build and build and build to an eventual shotgun blast of a climax that really is an emotional gut punch. The The one thing I don't like, though, about the ending is there's some great stuff at the ending with Doughboy and Trey where Doughboy's talking about how the mainstream media doesn't give a shit about what's going on in the hood they either know or they don't show what's going on in the hood you know there's a bunch of african americans dying in my neighborhood in the hood in hoods all across the u.s and nobody gives a shit it's never talked about but all this stuff that's going on overseas and you know, that's that's uh, big time news and it's a center of attention and it's a great point it, it really is and it's still something that sadly to this day is true that a lot of mainstream media a lot of these publications a lot of the even after blm and all this stuff going on even after all of that this it still wasn't really that much of a focus in terms of all these people who die in the hood every day and it's and it's not just gang members too shooting each other it's also these people who uh get shot who were just walking home one night and wind up getting hit by a stray bullet or these people 
who wind up getting killed like Ricky for the most petty bullshit reasons imaginable because you got a bunch of young immature kids who have deadly weapons who have really learned no other way to handle beefs other than violence so instead of talking things out they just shoot first and don't even bother asking questions later they just shoot people they just kill them because you know i don't like them i don't i don't like i don't like the way that they treated me even though i'm the one that escalated things and i came in and was being completely inappropriate and just being a straight up asshole to these people and they retaliated well now because they retaliated i'm gonna kill them it's the kind of thing that i can't even wrap my head around in terms of going that quickly to that kind of decision like just at, a, at the drop of a hat just snap my fingers bam all right they're these motherfuckers are dead like i can't even really you know, and that's because I'm not a part of that environment. I'm not a part of that setting. And it it's understandable that if you are a part of that, that's natural. That's a natural thing. And it's also, in a lot of ways, it becomes tied into a lot of people's survival. So it's another one of those things where, well, we can't let them show, show us up. So we better show them, you know, we mean business. And in order to do that, we're going to have to kill some motherfuckers. It's fucked up, but it's understandable when you when you look at the context of, of things. But what I'm saying about the ending I don't like is that Doughboy's death is just a text crawl. I, I, I don't understand why that was the decision... I know some people really like that because he says his piece. He says that somebody's, you know, everyone's got to go sometime. Yeah, and then he fades away. And then you get the text crawl that he died two weeks later. Because it's based on a true story. But it's one of those things where I just think it would have been more effective and powerful if you actually did see him die. Instead of this uh, text crawl. But that's like one of the few problems I have with the film is just the ending with the text crawl. That's really about it because everything else I, I think is compelling and really strong. It's one of the best dramas of this type that I've seen because of the strength of the characters in terms of the writing. I really loved the dynamic between Furious and his son, Trey. Uh, and I like the dynamic between Trey and Doughboy and Trey and Ricky as well and and I like the fact that there are moments of levity that showcase different sides of the hood. It doesn't just show the decay. It doesn't just show the violence and, and the chaos. It actually shows the, the light moments, the cookouts, the, the moments where you know, the, the gang members are playing games with one another and fucking with each other and, and just having fun. I like the fact that it's showing both sides because that was very refreshing and it was definitely refreshing for this genre because a lot of the time before this film and even even after you had a lot of moments where it's just like everything's just fucked up and bleak and it sucks and the hood is horrible and it's hell and da 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 and yeah in a lot of ways it is but there are moments where it, it's it's fun it's 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 an environment that people legitimately do love being a part of and it was nice to see that on film because it showcases why it's hard for a lot of people to leave because there's a lot of people despite what's going on it, it, it feels like a legit community for them and it's something that they don't have anywhere else and then you just got an amazing cast with Cuba Gooding Jr. who at this time was still very uh, young and full of energy and still was hungry as an actor to really showcase his talents. 
Uh, I thought it was a great bit of casting. I know Will Smith was initially maybe considered, but he declined because of his uh, commitment to Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. I think Will Smith would have done a great job, too. Honestly, it would have been interesting to have seen Will Smith as Trey. But Cuba Gooding Jr. still did a uh, really good job with the character. You really grew to like the guy. He had a lot of genuine charisma. And he di really did portray the character's naivete really well because it was a very naive character and i, I thought kuba, kuba just nailed that aspect of the character angela bassett as the mother of uh, ricky and actually no i think angela bassett i think she just plays the mother i think she plays the mother of trey i think i could be wrong might be some other um other actress but no i think it is angela bassett angela bassett was great i mean she she's usually really great anyway so yeah yeah it was uh angela bassett as reva um lawrence fishburne this is one of his best performances of his entire career and this was also a, a really big watershed moment for his career. Like it was a big deal because prior to this, he was doing like Pee-wee's Playhouse and some of these other films. And I think, I think he did, I think he was also doing, he did deep cover before this, but this was a film that got a lot of critical acclaim. And I think it really did uh, put him on the map in a lot of different ways for a lot of uh, casting directors. And you can see why he's just so powerful in this. It's such a great performance and the speeches that he gives to the the kids and to his son and all of that is just very uh, just memorable to me and uh, just really compelling uh there's that whole bit where he's talking about like why is there a why are there gun stores on every corner in our neighborhood why are there as many gun stores as liquor stores because they want us to keep killing ourselves. And you're like, man, that's that's actually really poignant. And that hits hard. And there's a lot of moments like that. And a lot of those really hard-hitting moments of social commentary usually came through with Lawrence Fishburne's character, Furious, uh, doling out advice. Ice Cube, he was incredible as Doughboy. Very authentic. Uh, really uh, great performance. There's a, there's a lot of vulnerability to it as well. Uh, I think it honestly might be his best acting performance to this day uh, as a Doughboy. Morris Chestnut, really great bit of casting as Ricky. Uh, I also want to give uh, the kids who played the young uh, Trey, uh, yeah, the kids who played young Trey, uh, Doughboy, and Ricky a lot of credit too. The they also did a good job for kid actors. Uh, Desi Arnaz Hines, the second Baja Jackson and Donovan Mc, uh, McCray uh, or Mick Carey. That's actually his last name. But yeah, Morse Chestnut. Uh, it was a really good bit of casting for him to play this like aspiring athlete who really does seem like he's going to be going to. Uh, a lot of bigger and brighter places in his life. And I thought his acting when, when he was uh, gunned down was also really believable. And it didn't feel like he was just overdoing it, which happens a lot when people wind up doing death scenes, they tend to like overdo it, but that wasn't the case here. Uh, I also like Nia Long It's Brandy. Uh, John Singleton himself even has a cameo as, as a mailman. You've got Whitman Mayo who plays this old man who has these old ideal deals and saying all this stuff that Furious ultimately has to, to correct him on and really tell him what's up. Derek D. Gobert is Dookie. Baldwin C. Sykes is Monster. They were solid for what they were asked to do. Uh, as was uh, Raymond Turner as Ferris, the lead of this other rival gang who ultimately are the ones behind Ricky's death. And you also have Lloyd Avery II 
who plays the trigger man, the man who shot Ricky. And you know what's really kind of crazy is that after this film's release, that actor joined the Bloods in real life. And he wound up getting arrested and he was convicted of a lot of crimes, actually. A ton of, like, a legitimate uh, amount of crimes. And as a result, yeah, he was, uh, he was arrested in real life in connection with a double homicide. He was sentenced to life in prison, and then he was given the death penalty. Nuts. It's crazy. It's insane how much life imitated art in that instance. Oh, and I also want to give credit to uh, uh, the actor Jesse Lawrence Ferguson, who played the racist black cop, Officer Coffee, because that had to be a very difficult role. And uh, I want to give him a lot of credit and props for pulling that off as well, because it didn't seem like it was uh, insincere, even though I, I know it must have been an incredibly hard role for him to do, because it probably did not at all speak for the kind of person that he is and his character. So I think he deserves a ton of credit for still just handling it as professionally as he possibly could and still delivering a very believable performance. The film features some legitimately uh, nice looking cinematography by Charles Mills. For this kind of film, it's not going to wow you or stun you with the visuals, but I do feel it captured a certain amount of vibrancy and uh, when it comes to uh, the sequences at the cookouts and with the kids hanging out with one another, as well as a certain sense of darkness and, and grit when it comes to uh, the sequences that are supposed to be darker in nature and in tone. The music by Stanley Clark, it's fine. I don't think it's like particularly... Uh, memorable or amazing or like really noteworthy but it works for the film it fits the film fine enough the running time it's only like 112 minutes and it goes by at a pretty good pace because you're consistently engaged with the plot because you're engaged with these characters this is more of a character study and a character piece and it's a really effective one. It's a really strong character piece because of how well written these characters are and uh, just leads to a lot of genuine emotions that you feel throughout the film. You, you feel happiness, you feel sadness, you, you feel uh, anger and, and all of these different uh, emotions. And that's a sign of a really successful film. Because films, I don't care who you are, they are meant to make you feel one way or another. If they don't make you feel, then they failed. They failed to do what a film is supposed to do and what a genuinely compelling story is supposed to do. It's supposed to make you feel something. So this idea that uh, you need to be objective when it comes to films, when it comes to criticizing them, I, never, I really don't get. Because... It's all about feeling something. And if you're objective about something, then you're not allowing yourself to feel. Because that's the whole point of being objective, is that you're not allowing your feelings to uh, really sway uh, how you feel about something. And I think with films, you're supposed to go, go for the ride. You're supposed to allow your feelings to... Uh, make you emote to and connect to something to a film and the story and the characters in, in a very resonant way and if it doesn't do that then it's just not a very good film so and it's not a very good narrative or a good story and boys in the hood is, is definitely not one of those examples it, it it grabs you it keeps you invested and and by the end of it it still keeps you thinking about a lot of these issues that are still very real now and will continue to be real and genuine and uh raw to years from now 
So anyway, uh, thanks for watching my review of Boys in the Hood, and as always, I'll see you later. See ya.